Welcome back to the Buddy Ruski Show. This is episode 18. My guest today is Nevi Ramadanovich. It's a lot harder to say than it sounds, trust me. Nevi is someone who I have had the pleasure of working with a lot over the years. Nevi spent a lot of time in the runaway orbit when I worked there. We got to work on a few events together, including uh, a stop in Charlotte for our New Carolina tour back in 2017. He and I talked about how he got into DJing, who his inspirations are in the industry, and how he's been able to maintain during COVID. Obviously, we've all been stuck at home, and like many of you, Nevi has been reflecting on the past, trying to live in the present, while also planning for an uncertain near future. I found the conversation to be a much needed jolt of energy. Nevi is funny, thoughtful, and great at his job. I thoroughly enjoyed the conversation, and I hope you do as well. As always, you can support the show on Patreon, patreon.com backslash Buddy Ruski. Okay, here's my conversation with Nevi, but first, a phonics lesson. All right, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to make sure that I get this right again. Shit. <laughs> <laughs> I, the thing is, like, I get all the sounds, but I can't get the the like pron- the right pronunciation or the right like cadence yeah you no i got it i got times. it no i got it i got it Ram- ramon ramad god damn it <laughs> everyone's gonna get to hear this too I'm, I'm not i'm not taking this out everyone's just gonna hear me failing <laughs> <laughs> ramadanovich okay ramadan i mean you could just call me dj nevy I know, but I feel like it's appropriate. To, AKA, yeah. Yeah. You know, I, I, it's, it's a, it's yeah. not, you're more than just your DJing. So it's, it feels appropriate to I me to make sure that people, uh, I appreciate that. Yeah. Um, yeah, man. How, <laughs> go uh, for huh? go for it again. <laughs> I wasn't no, oh. Ramadan, Ramadanovich, Ramadanovich. It is. Nevi yeah. Ramadanovich. If I need to, I'm just going to start it right here. <laughs> <laughs> You're in. You're in, bro. That was good. Thanks for being on the Buddy Ruski show today, man. Yeah, dude. Thanks for having me, bro. It's, it's really cool to, to get up with you um, in, a, in a different way. You know, we've we've uh, had a lot of fun times together and done things together in the past through Runaway, and it's really cool to kind of switch it up here and do something different. I agree. Yeah, it's been one of my, one of the joys, one of the silver linings of the last couple of years before COVID and even during COVID of reconnecting with people from, from my time at Runaway, there were so many creatives that were in that orbit and, you know, just we're all getting older, but also just like some of those institutions Runaway included that we would all gather at either don't exist or we can't gather because of, of the virus. So it's just been nice to check in with people and cause that, you know, those years, I'm sure you feel this way too. Like the, the mid 2010s for me were just like a whirlwind of, of fun and anxiety too, but just like mixing it up with everybody was, uh, yeah, it was just like insane. I don't know. I, I, it's like, I think fondly <laughs> of those times so much and, uh, and yeah, you were definitely a big part of that. And, um, so I'm excited to, to chop it up and, and just spend time together too outside of anything else yes sir yes sir likewise well i agree with you 100 percent, man those you know it's kind of like uh kind of getting lost kind of lost in the sauce type you know like we're all uh kind of enjoying each other's space and doing things together and collaborating and i think not until later on we didn't really realize what it did for the city um and just having that space where people can come together and uh be creative <laughs> Yeah. Well, I'd love to to rewind a bit and talk to you a little bit about, because if I remember correctly, DJing is not necessarily something you 
had planned on getting into. You kind of found your way into DJing. Um, so I'd love to hear just a little bit about, uh, you know, your background, your upbringing, um, and then kind of make our way into how you actually got into DJing. I guess we can start off from the from the very beginning. You know, born in Connecticut, uh, come from uh, a European background. I'm, um, I'm uh, Greek, Turkish, and Macedonian. Um, my mom was first generation. She moved here when she was uh, two. And um, when I was about four years old, we moved to Chapel Hill. Uh, my parents had uh, split up, got divorced. What part of Connecticut are you from? The Wolcott area, but I have family in Danbury, New Haven, um, Waterbury, I mean, everywhere. So I was only there, you know, I moved here right before first grade uh, to Chapel Hill. And uh, my aunt actually, uh, my mom had a sister that lived in Durham. So, you know, she did some research and she wanted a new beginning and voila, we ended up here in Chapel Hill and it was great. Um, I can't thank my mom enough for giving me the opportunity to be in uh, just the Chapel Hill School District alone. I mean, <laughs> academics was a, a big part of that decision and I'm very uh, thankful for that. So yeah, we moved down here and I grew up in Chapel Hill my whole life. Um, I'd say, you know, music and sports were the constant. I mean, music was always there. I just never thought about it, uh, of monetizing it, you know, creating, you know, could this, can I make money off of this? Like never. And uh, it was always a passion of mine. So I grew up playing sports and I eventually went to a private school in Greensboro, uh, Greensboro College to play football. Unfortunately, I dislocated my knee and I had knee surgery before my freshman year even started that summer. I don't think I would have taken you for a football player. <laughs> yeah, well, I used to look a lot different as well. I mean, I was like the no neck. Like, I weighed like 25 more pounds than I do now. Uh, I played a corner, wide receiver, well, slot receiver, punt returner, kick returner. Um, but yeah, I, I was a little undersized, but I went hard, you know, <laughs> I was like, couldn't take no shortcuts. It plays off, but, um, yeah, I, I missed it, man. Uh, I, I miss it. I love it. Competing. It was great. Uh, so yeah, basically, uh, went to that private school and then, uh, tried to come back my sophomore year, dislocated my knee again. And I was like, all right, that's when I had the knee surgery, actually. Sorry. I had knee surgery before my sophomore year and I, uh, ended up transferring to UNC Greensboro. And um, long story short, through my physical therapy and just that whole process with my therapist, uh, it really brought me to the part, to a point in my life where I, I kind of realized uh, I would love to do this for someone else, help them walk again, um, you know, give them their confidence back. And just, I mean, that was, that was a really big experience for me, uh, left a big impression on me. Um, I had a, uh, a therapist by the name of uh, Dr. Bob Bruzga over at Duke and uh, Dr. Claude T. Mormon, who's a, a well-known uh, orthopedic surgeon, did my uh, knee surgery. He, he did Jay Williams. I don't know if you remember him from Duke. He, he did a bunch of uh, athletes and celebrities throughout the years. He was the Ravens uh, orthopedic doctor when they won the Super Bowl. And so, uh, honestly, my knee was great. I played intramural sports at UNCG. I had no issues with it. Um, it, was, it was awesome for 10 years. We'll, we'll wrap around to that later. But um, yeah, bro. So I studied sports medicine. Uh, I studied kinesiology with a sports medicine concentration. I was, I graduated. I moved back to Chapel Hill. I was getting my clinical hours. Uh, I was working at a physical therapy clinic called Comprehensive Physical Therapy Center in Chapel Hill. I did that for a year. I was getting ready for grad school. And um, like I said, music was always there. Um, I was a huge like hip hop head growing up. I took a solo trip to Chicago and that's really what started it all. I was like, I've never done a solo trip. So I did some research. I wanted to go to Chicago and I realized they had a DJ academy there called Scratch Academy that Jam Master J had created and um, before he passed. And so I was like, you know what? I'm gonna go get some DJ lessons while I'm in Chicago. And you know, they had like six week programs, had all these courses. I didn't have that time, you know? So I just went and got private lessons. You pay by the hour. Fortunately, I went during the month of uh, July, the beginning of July of 2013 and there were no courses. So I took advantage of the office hours. So I was in there, I paid for two hours, maybe three hours a day, 10 to one. And I stayed there until 9 p.m. And there were no other kids in there. 8 p.m., you know, I was in there all day and I learned old school. 
no computer, all vinyl, use your ears. And uh, it was life-changing, man. I became obsessed. Um, I always had friends though, that were producers, rappers. Um, one of my really good friends who, you know, I can't think enough, Jack Gallagher, shout out Jack Gallagher. He works for C3 management. Um, you know, they manage Future, Jack Harlow. He manages an awesome group called Mount Joy. They're booming, they're killing it right now. Um, Y'all look up Mount Joy. Also, he, um, you know, he manages Adam Melcher. Um, he's an up and coming singer. He's, he's really talented. So I always kind of, I always kind of had people around me that were in that creative space of music. And um, yeah, I came back from the Academy and uh, shout out DJ Shazad as well. He gave me my first pair of turntables <laughs> and uh, it, was a, uh, it was an old pair of Newmark uh, setup. And <laughs> I just became obsessed, bro. I was practicing every day for like six, eight hours a day, nonstop. And so what ended up happening was I, was, I, was wor I started working at a clinical research company. It was my first corporate job. And I'm still just practicing at my house or whatever. But within, I learned in July and I had my first gig in September. <laughs> so, you know, two months later at a house party in Carborough. And October 12th, I opened up for my mentor, DJ A minor. Shout out DJ A minor. He's a Charlotte DJ. He went, uh, he yeah. wrestled at UNC. He's now the Hornets DJ, but he took me under his wing. We always connected on music. We would talk for hours about music. And I opened for him one night at the library um, on Franklin Street. Shout out the library. It's my, my first place I DJed. I was the I house DJ. I love that there place so much. <laughs> Tequila Tuesday. And um, yeah, yeah, yeah. But so I, uh, I opened for him and I was like, I don't know what I just did, but I want to do that again. And uh, it was amazing, bro. I just became obsessed. I quit my corporate job after three months. Um, you know, basically that, that, that October I opened up for a minor and I was still working at the clinic until January. I quit the clinic and I worked at the research company, CGRRB, to, um, it's an uh, independent review board in RTP. I worked there from, I don't know, uh, February to May or something. And I quit and I was like, man, I'm, I'm giving this DJ thing a like a shot. I, I don't know what I'm doing. So I didn't go to, I didn't, never applied to grad school. And for the next six years, you know, DJing was my full-time job. I never, I never wanted to be a DJ. I learned for fun. I, when I went to Chicago, I was like, you know, I, why not learn? Like, this is cool. There's an academy right here. And, um, you know, I guess I can tap back into my upbringing in regards to music, I was always a huge hip hop head. I mean, I was, I was into the Nas, you know, I was into Jay-Z, I was into all that, but I was also into like the underground, like, like uh, MERS and Immortal Technique and Hieroglyphics and, um, you know, Atmosphere, Black Alicious and all these other underground artists. Uh, I grew up in Cat's Cradle, uh, shout out to Cat's Cradle. I, that place is so epic, bro. Like so many memories there. And, uh, you know, I also had a friend, uh, his name's Honor, and his dad was Drez from Black Sheep. Um, you know, you could get with this, or you could get with that. Oh, and shit. so, yeah, he, I met him my freshman year of high school, and he moved here from Brooklyn, and we just became best friends, and that was another huge influence in terms of hip-hop. I mean, all we did was watch skate videos and listen to hip-hop, like, <laughs> and, you know, we were heavy you know, we were the teenagers going to Rock M shows. I can tell that story later, maybe. But you know, we were those kids, like almost like ten years, uh, you know, late listening to Tribe Called Quest. You know, listening to all those, uh, you know, to Rock M, all those older artists. I remember Little Brother playing at Cat's Cradle, and that was pr that's probably one of my best memories. Method Man. I've seen a lot of artists there. I saw Jay Cole before, right when he got signed to uh, Rock Nation. Nobody knew who he was. He opened for Wale. And I think this was in 2010. Wale was the main act. He had, he had just blown up. He had Nike boots with Lil Wayne. And that was his coming yeah. out. Man, J. Cole kills it, bro. Everyone was like, who is this guy? I looked him up before the show. He had like two songs on YouTube. It was like an acoustic version of Losing My Balance and like one other song. And um, I was always the blog head. I was always reading blogs. And I didn't know about this dude. I'm like, who, who's J. Cole? He kills it. Wale comes out and he literally says it on the mic. He's like, how am I supposed to follow that? He was like, shook it, bro. He was so shook. 
And so, uh, yeah, shout out Cad's Cradle, man. I saw everyone there. I have a little list. Uh, little Brother, Ninth Wonder, J. Cole, Wiz Khalifa, Wale, Method Man, the craziest show I've ever seen in my life. Method Man at Cad's Cradle. Standing on, crowd standing, not crowd surfing. Ripping the insulation out of the ceiling. There's a picture of it in the newspaper. Um, I think that was my senior year of high school. Kazi was another, um, shout out Kazi, man. He's doing things. He's always been a big part of the uh, creative space uh, as a local artist. Um, I've always looked up to him. He's super talented. And I mean, he was always opening for all the main acts back then. Shout out Camp Lowe as well. Uh, love Camp Lowe. Always repping North Carolina. Um, the away team. Like I said, I've seen Murs there, Rockham, Black Delicious, Atmosphere, Hieroglyphics. Mike Realm, shout out Mike Realm. A lot of people might not know him. He's a DJ producer. He was the first DJ I saw do uh, visuals. And it was so cool, bro. Like he had it all synced up. This is in maybe 2006, 2005. It, it wasn't, you know, nobody was doing that. So he was ahead of his time. Um, I saw Mac Miller there too. And I met him and everything backstage because my boy, uh, shout out KO Kid, Cobra. He opened for him. Sorry, I could go on about Cat's Cradle and music for a long time. <laughs> no, it's it's awesome, man. Having Cat's Cradle in your backyard is like, I think people take it for granted. It's such an amazing yeah. venue. And it used to be, you could, I mean, all those people you named coming to that kind of venue, you know, you would think that you were living in like a big city. You know, mostly, you know, you usually get like these big, bigger cities that have these type of venues that people want to tour through especially if they're doing like a major album release or something but cat's cradle yeah. always seemed to get these guys especially the underground dudes because i'm the same way i grew up on all the people you mentioned black alicious jurassic five dilated people's atmosphere okay. aesop oh. rock you know all the rhyme sayers people all the like deaf jokes people um yeah. so and then and then same thing like with all the, the old school cats too uh tribe and and most deaf and rock him and and uh de la soul all that stuff so oh, yeah, yeah. I, I wish like hearing you say that i'm like man i wish i had known about cat's cradle way earlier because i think the first show well the first show i went to was jurassic five i saw them at wake forest and then i saw the roots in south carolina in high school too with with my friends sammy and, and jeremy uh, jeremy's dad took us down there to see the roots they were doing their game theory tour and that was that was amazing they like I've to this day probably still never seen like a band rock Bro. out for three hours the way that the roots yeah. just I saw them in high school at UNC they came to one of the halls and their transitions I saw the internet shout out the internet I saw the internet like three years ago in Charlotte and they were transitioning you know it's, they're transitioning from song to song you know they didn't have gaps you know they would just transition and jam into the next song and they were doing a good job but seeing the roots in high school ruined that for me. I was like, the roots would jam for five minutes just for the transition. And I'm like, yo, and it's flawless. And I'm like, insane. I got to meet them backstage because my boy, Jack Gallagher, the manager, he, you know, he actually got Talib Kweli to come. Uh, when he was in high school, he was interning at Cat's Cradle. So he got Talib, he somehow got Talib to come to Cradle. And anyway, that's another story. He, we got, we got to go and meet the roots in their van before they dipped after the show. And I just remember shaking Questlove's hand, bro. And I know that the people can't see this, but I shook his hand and his hand went like halfway up my forearm. And I was like, oh, nice to meet you, bro. It's a giant human. But yeah, um, I, kn I knew you always had a good ear for music. It's dope to hear you like recall the same kind of influence as, as myself. And it's funny, you, you talked about going to the academy and just kind of messing around and getting into DJing almost by accident. Because I remember there's a moment for me, I think this was in high school or maybe right after high school, where I was in Guitar Center at, here in Durham. It I don't know if it's still over by Northgate Mall, but there was a Guitar Center over by Northgate Mall. Ooh, and I, okay. And, uh, and I went in there and they had a turntable set up and I had never really, my dad, DJ when I was a kid, but he mostly did um, like school dances and stuff. And he would put together mixes. So he wasn't live scratching. He was just put together mixes and, um, you know, was really good about, he was more like a, almost like a stage manager. Like he'd get up there and have the music playing. But then this is when 
you know, in like the late nineties, early two thousands where music videos were still pretty big. So he would have his projector screen with the music videos playing with the, with the songs and he'd have his cool like tower lights and, and he'd get on the mic and would talk about the music, but then also he would be doing the announcements for the show or for the, like, you know, if it was prom or something, like he'd be the one like saying, okay, you know, voting for prom king queens coming up, like make sure you're in this place to, for whatever. And so, um, so I grew up around music as well. And I remember going into guitar center that day, messing around with the turntables. And I, it was, um, it was, I tried to like, I swear, I wish I had recorded it and like exported it on my, on like a flash drive or something. Cause I had mixed pretty boy swag with some other song. And it just sounded like so insanely dope for like, for the <laughs> little amount of knowledge that I had about DJing. And then I could just like, never remember how, like how to do it again after that. And, uh, but uh, yeah, I had a similar moment where I was like, man, maybe I should get into DJing. And it just like, I, I didn't have, I, well, so what's funny is like for my, I told myself for the last handful of years for my 30th birthday, I was going to get a set of turntables and uh, I turned 30 this past October, but I am still like very much interested, at least as a hobbyist in, in getting a, a set of turntables and, and testing the waters. So I'm not coming for your job or anything, but I'm just, I'm interested <laughs> in the sport. I've never had that kind of uh, approach when it comes to DJing. I mean, I'm, I'm confident and uh, I'm not, you know, I think there's a big difference between that and cockiness. And so I, I've never been out here like, Oh, I'm better than this dude. I'm better than that guy. I'm competing with this DJ. No, like, you know, there's enough for everyone to win. And I mean, the market's pretty straight around here. And um, yeah, it's really, isn't it, isn't it so cool how, music can just you have that moment in guitar center and you remember that feeling you might not remember the song you blended but you remember the feeling and that's that's it bro like that's the whole thing for me and it's so weird because I, I left this out i i played music uh, i don't call it djing i brought in my own cds in college on 103.1 shout out wuag shout out jack uh was it bonnie i think his last name is i'm tripping on that but he was uh the director over there at uncg 103.1 and uh, he was just an awesome dude. And so it, I, I, you know, going back on, I mean, just not really realizing it, it's like, I, I had a Thursday night set for three years. Um, and that was college night, nine to 11 PM. So I go in the studio and I brought in, you know, two CDs, 20, 20 to 22 songs on each CD. I think it was, and you just go back and forth, you know, it's not DJ and you're just turning up levels on a soundboard and you know, whatever. <laughs> and, um, I really enjoyed that. It was so fun. I used to shoot the link out on my Facebook and it was, uh, I, I never, even then, I never thought I was a DJ. I didn't consider myself one. And I never thought, Hey, I should pursue this after college. I mean, it was, it was never. And, uh, you know, it's just so weird. Cause I had my friend, um, my friend Ellie, shout out Ellie. She, I grew up with her and she messaged me one day, like a year ago. And she was just like, oh my God, I'm listening to the CD you made me in, in like eighth grade or like seventh grade or something like that. You know, I had another friend do that to me, message me as well. And they said that and I was just like, man, I've been a DJ since like middle school. And like, I just never realized, like it's been right in front of my eyes the whole time. I was that same way. Yeah, <laughs> you were that guy. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I would make like, you know, cause my dad had so many songs. He had this, you know, the like, huge cd wallets full of of mixes that he had and then he'd have all the you know original cds that he, he burned all the stuff from so you know i would go through tons and tons of of albums and uh and put together these mixes and and it just like i yeah it was another one of those things i just got so much joy out of trying to put together like i thought it was one of the things that i've tried to get back to recently because you know now you've got playlists and for me sometimes my playlists get really bloated where i'm just dumping like hundreds yes. of songs into a playlist yes. and i kind of want to get back to the like building some constraints around the mix like you only get you know 15 songs max like you would on a cd and how do you like put that. together like a real cohesive thing that almost feels like an album in itself even though you're pulling music from other people you know it might not be all the same artists but you're trying to make like an album essentially because you only get so many songs and that was just something that i really enjoyed and it sounds like you did too and 
to this day, I, I still love making playlists. Anytime yeah. somebody, it's, it's like one of my great joys. Yeah. If somebody's asked me for music recommendations and I'm just like, fuck yeah. Like I got two hours. <laughs> let's do this. <laughs> yeah. It's so weird. Like, like just, you know, you bring up how your, your sources you had back then, you know, you had your father, which is amazing. And I, I think that's so dope. And like, for me, I was obsessed with the blogs. Like all I did, I didn't realize till later, I was like, I was listening to music when I woke up. I was listening to music in between classes. I was listening to mu music while I was working out. And then I was listening to music when I was leaving the gym to go home to study. Like, so it was always right in front of your face. And I was that cat. Like I was the cat that always had the ox at any party. I was, I was always that guy. And it was right in front of my face. And I, I think that's cool though, that it didn't, it wasn't something that I forced and, um, it, it's so weird. I, I was, all I did was read blogs. So, you know, you had the two dope boys back then. You had good music all day. You had, I, I had like 20, I read a day and now it's so different. What, I don't, I don't dislike it now. It's just back then you might've listened to, I don't know, maybe 50 songs on a blog, you know, just scrolling and reading. And you might find like maybe 10, maybe seven that you liked, at least for me. And, uh, that doesn't really exist anymore because we've, we've become so efficient um, with our, our uh, the way we uh, find music. You know, if it's, just, if it's not on SoundCloud, Spotify, or, you know, Apple Music. And as a DJ, I, I don't want to get too far into this, but if you play a song on the dance floor, from my experience, if they haven't heard it on Spotify, SoundCloud, TikTok, Apple Music, especially TikTok now, um, they could know who it is and still think it's whack. You know, it's like, and that's when I can kind of feel out a crowd. Like if a crowd has a lot of rhythm or like, you know, they, you know, they can dance and they're just there to enjoy the moment and they might not know the music and they're just, and they're rocking with you, they're vibing. I'm like, yes, I've got a, like an open-minded crowd. But I'll never forget this. It was uh, when Drake dropped trophies. It was right around uh, New Year's of, I think 20, from 13 to 14. I think it was my first, I might be wrong, but I think it was my first New Year's Eve I DJ. And I was only like four months into DJing. I didn't know what I was doing. And I was at the library and I showed, I had a bunch of friends. I had like 20 friends show up from Greensboro uh, and they all got a hotel and all this stuff. And we all pregame there. And I was like, yo, peep this new Drake song. And I played it and they all thought it was dope. And then we went to the library and I played it like halfway through the night, you know, peak hour. And bro, like all my like 20 friends were like turning up and lit and like, it's Drake. Like, you know, Drake's voice. And the other like part of the crowd was just like kind of confused. And I'm like, guys, just react. Like you don't <laughs> have to know the song. And like any DJ you have on this podcast will say that. Like, it's kind of like a, it, 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 it can be very bothersome, the DJs. And I've kind of learned to work with it. And you kind of create this, 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 this process of, of trust. You kind of gain their trust. So, you know, first 30 minutes, you're giving them what they want, maybe, then they start to trust you a little bit. And then I like to call it sandwiching. You know, you play two or three songs they want to hear, and then you play like one that you want to play that they might not know, but they trust you and they're a little bit more comfortable and open-minded now. So I, I think it's really funny how, uh, you know, this, the way we get our music and, you know, the attention span of a crowd and just people in general, they just, you know, they just want that next status, the, the next tweet, the next update. Like it's the same thing with music and dancing. And I think there's like a couple artists you can play longer than a minute and a half in a club. And it's like Drake and like, I, I, you know, I don't even know now, but definitely Drake. <laughs> Do you, do you remember what that journey was like in between? So you like learn how to DJ, you start getting gigs, you decide to do it full time. What is like the, the transition process between hobbyist to, you know, full fledged yeah. professional and like, 
you know, were there any pitfalls there? You're going full speed and then all of a sudden you're like, actually, I'm not getting enough gigs to like do what I need to do oh, yeah. or um, people aren't feeling what I'm playing. Like, what is that? What is that journey like? No, that's a great question, bro. Fortunately, man, for me, I never had that problem. Uh, never had the problem of not having enough gigs to sustain, uh, you know, the dream or to, you know, to pay my bills or, and I've never had that issue. And I'm, I thank God for that, bro. Like never. And, you know, I, I, uh, I'm not gonna lie. I did have like, you know, some connections going in though. Like, I, like I said, my friend, Jack Gallagher, he used to manage the library. So I already knew the owners at the library. I'm from Chapel Hill. I didn't go to college in Chapel Hill, but you know, I already, it started off with the library and um, my, uh, my big homie, one of my best friends, my mentor, uh, DJ A minor, he moved to Charlotte and he had a night called Tequila Tuesday, which I know you're familiar with. We've had a lot of fun nights and he left and I inherited Tequila Tuesday. And this was like within the first year. Uh, so I remember right off the back, I got Tequila Tuesdays and I'm like, uh, I, I, actually, I, let me go back. I remember I got a Friday and I was like, okay, cool. Like I'm DJing somewhere on a Friday night. And I was like, this is really cool. And they say, hey, we want you back for another Friday. I'm pretty sure it was a library. I think we we're doing a 90s night. And um, it's like, all right, sick. Now I have a gig every Friday, uh, a residency. And then, you know, I think maybe it wasn't long, bro. You know, R&R &R was around back then. You had Deep End. Um, you know, you had Topo, you had Back Bar, you had some other small bars that aren't around anymore, uh, and uh, East End, Martini Bar. And it didn't take long for me to get my feet wet and to just start kind of making those connections and getting gigs instantly because it's a small town. They all knew each other. So, oh, yeah, you need a DJ? Nebby's great. Uh, he just started. Da -da -da. And that's kind of how it happened. But so I got a Friday, and then I don't know after how long, maybe not even a month, I got a Saturday. And I'm like, Sick. Now, now I have a full weekend of DJ. I have a Friday and a Saturday. And, you know, everyone's work ethic is, is different. And that standard you set in terms of your work ethic is dependent upon your motivation and, and what, you're, what you think is busy. <laughs> and I think that's a sliding scale, to, you know, depending on who you are. So for me, I got that Friday, I got that Saturday. I'm like, all right, cool. Now I have like a full weekend of DJing almost. Then I got a Tuesday and uh, A minor left to Charlotte. And, then, and this is all within the first year. Then I got a Tequila Tuesday. I'm like, all right, now I'm DJing Friday, Saturday, Tuesday. And at the time I'm like, damn, I'm, I'm DJing a lot. I'm DJing three, three days a week. The next thing I know, I get a throwback Thursday at Back Bar. So now I'm doing, I'm doing throwback Thursday at Back Bar. So that's four days a week. And that was, yeah, right about a year in and you know, once I quit my corporate job, so I had been DJing for about five, six months. And that, when I, when I just, it was all fun and games, you know, I was wilding, you know, you have all the stereotypes around DJs, oh, girls drinking, partying, da, 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 da. that's not where I have been. Ever since I decided not to go to grad school and it became my career and I committed and I didn't, and I quit my corporate job, it all switched for me within the first eight months of DJing. Um, I will admit, I was wilding out that first, <laughs> that first like six to 10 months. And um, it all switched for me though. My focus, everything changed. And I was like, this is a business and um, I still have fun. You know that, but I take my job. I take it very seriously. I don't want to lose the crowd. You know, you don't have, like I said, the attention span is not that long. You can lose a crowd like that. And um, you know, people say, oh, the girls and all that kind of stuff. It's like, no, bro. Like you have to think about it in the bigger picture. If you like, let's, let's say you pull a girl from DJ and you guys are hooking up or whatever you, you know, for, you're hanging out for a month or two and it goes sour, you know, <laughs> usually does. And, uh, that girl, depending on how that, that situation ended, she's not going to most likely, she's not going to come back and support you. She's not going to rock with you and bring her friends. Say, yo, hey, let's go support Nev tonight. Let's go. And I think about that and I care about that stuff a lot. So as a DJ, I never really care how hot a girl is or even with dudes. I, I treat them all the same way. It's like, yo, what's up? You want to say what's up? What's up? How are you doing? Oh, you want a shot? Boom, boom, boom. Put it on my tab. Boom, do the shot, whatever. Right back. I'm locked right back in. 
And I know a lot of people have always told me throughout the years, oh, you're like intimidating while you're DJing because you're in a zone. And I'm doing technical stuff that requires attention and detail. You can mess up so easy. You press the wrong button, the track restarts. You lose the crowd. They boo you, whatever happens. So yeah, I'm sorry. I'm kind of getting off topic, but I'll go back to the schedule thing and the work ethic and the standard you set. So, you know, then I'm DJing. I'm, de- I'm now DJing Friday, Saturday, Tuesday, Thursday. And then I got a, a brunch gig at Lucha, T- at Lucha Tigre on Sundays. Shout out my boy Qua. Shout out Lucha Tigre. Love that place. Love the food. Love all the employees. Qua is amazing. I could talk about that guy all day. Shout out Dave Wiley and shout out Kyle Pearson as well uh, from the library, giving me my first chance at DJ and stuff. Love you guys. Shout out Steve uh, and AJ, the uh, owners after them. So basically what I'm referring to in terms of that work ethic is I started doing four days, then I did five nights a week, sometimes more, six, seven nights, but it was, I had five residencies, Tuesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday. And I did that for about four years straight. And what happens is you develop this complex. It's like, if I'm not DJing five nights a week, I'm not busy, at least for me. And that's what I mean by like, you set your own standard, you know, and, and, and you influence your work ethic and what you think is busy. And you can get caught up in that cycle very easily, bro. And I did. I mean, I put my career first over everything, you know, friendships, everything. And I didn't have to be DJing as much as I was, but I enjoyed it. And, you know, it's, it's like, okay, Nev, you could take a Friday off a month. You know, <laughs> like you can afford to, like it's, it, I wasn't doing it just for the money. I was also kind of just obsessive and COVID's really giving me, you know, a lot of time to think about all that stuff as well. So I remember having that same feeling with, uh, with Runaway as well, where mm-hmm. it, it was like the everything about all the hardships that came with late hours or having everything ready in the store before a big drop, just all that stuff didn't even really matter to me when we would throw an event and there'd be however many people there and they're just like having the time of their lives. I'm just like, man, this is like really worth it. And it's not even because they would come, you know, there you, you get people that come up to you and it is really nice to have folks appreciate the hard work you put in comes up to you while you're DJing and you're like, and you know, they say like, Oh dude, Nevi, like you killed that set. Like, you know, I can't wait to come back next week or whatever. Yeah. It, It really does put wind in your sails and, and I won't totally dismiss that outright, but there was just something like inherently good to me to see people having fun and enjoying themselves and just like knowing that positivity was being put into the world. People who, you know, were performers that, you know, they would DJ our parties and stuff. Like they were getting, uh, you know, they were getting something out of it. Like we were getting something out of it. The crowd was getting something out of it. Like everyone was just enjoying themselves and like being positively impacted. And so you, you start to, sort of get addicted to that sensation a bit and so i totally understand what you're saying about not needing to work that that hard but like just feeling like why not you're just like i'm young why like why not (laughs) just keep keep going um but you you alluded to this about like this you know 2020 and covid and and putting things in perspective and i think that that you know before we we got on we we talked about it and and i had been thinking about a lot too just like being forced to slow down and put put some things in order in your life like is is um is something that when you're working that hard it's hard to take a top down view you it's hard to see yourself objectively you're kind of just in it all the time and you're not able to pull yourself out and really evaluate what's going on because you're just constantly moving and so I, you know, I would love to hear a bit about what this, um, you know, without getting maybe too much into the specifics of COVID, just like what yeah. have you been able to learn about yourself and about that hustler mentality that you have, that a lot of creatives have, um, how have you been able to balance that with really not being able to do your craft in quite the same way that you normally do? Yeah, no doubt. Um, real quick, I just want to say I, I love what you just said, bro. Like you really just kind of summarized uh, 
everything about that, that feeling of, of giving and receiving and that rewarding feeling. I'm honestly, I always went with my core, my core. I knew I want to help people. Like that was my biggest thing with sports medicine. I played sports. I had knee surgery. I could relate. I want to help someone walk again. So when it came to DJing, I was like, I'm bringing people together. I'm making them happy. And like you said, Nevi, thank you for tonight. You know, someone saying that to a DJ, was, it goes such a long way, bro. Just for someone to come up to you, then like, yo, thank you. I had a horrible week. I mean, tonight was the best night of my life. Like, I love that stuff, bro. And like those, I, I was kind of lost in the sauce for like three, four years, just like going, 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 going. And I was in Charlotte every Friday for, you know, almost three years. I was, you know, all over the place every Friday driving to Charlotte and uh, shout out my boy, DJ Rang. We can get into, um, I know you kind of mentioned you want to talk about some of my DJ inspirations. We can tap into that later, but shout out my boy, DJ Rang, one of my mentors, uh, business, done a lot of business with him. He kind of got, he was a big influence on me because I stopped doing the bars and clubs as much. I stopped going to Charlotte. I started banking on myself more than those, that residential gig that gets you whatever, 350, 450 a night. You know what? I'm a bank on myself and do this wedding for, you know, 2000. And that's when you start to figure out, you know, what kind of DJs are out there for, that fit that stereotype. Oh, I just want to drink and party and the girls, the da, da, da. No, I love bringing families together. I love that experience. I love, you know, even the corporate party, seeing people at holiday events and seeing how happy these people who work nine to five and they're stuck in this, you know, box. And um, no, I'm sorry. I don't want to ignore your question, but I just, I want to piggyback off that. I love that you said that. And it's, it's so true. I didn't, I didn't really get to tap into that. And um, it's a very rewarding job and it, it does become kind of a disease. Like you just, you just, it's like, Oh, like, and you get obsessed and you're like, I want more of this. I don't know what it is, but I just I want to keep doing it. Um, but all right. Yeah. So uh, COVID <laughs> and uh, I've learned a lot, bro. Um, you hit the nail on the head with kind of having a different perspective and being able to pull yourself out of, you know, that sauce that you're lost in. Um, I'm a very, I'm sure the people in this, the listeners will be able to tell I'm very high strung. I'm trying to uh, chill out right now, but um, you're so used to going and working and grinding and grinding. And when all that's stripped away from you, um, it has been for me since March 8th was my last gig. It, it messes with your head, man. I mean, like, I, I've been just trying to find ways to be productive, um, you know, remaining relevant as a DJ, you know, doing streams and stuff like that. I'll tap into that. Um, but, you know, COVID hit, and I actually had knee surgery, my second knee surgery on February 24th of this year. My knee popped out again. And um, it's great, you know. Uh, the surgery went well, and I'm able to do everything, and play sports, run, whatever. I'm, everything's fine with that. So f ironically for the first three months, uh, from late February to July or so, I, you know, four months, I was rehabbing and, um, I, you know, it, it gave me some time to kind of reflect. Uh, I read a book called, uh, this is not a t-shirt by Bobby Kim, also known as Bobby hundreds from the hundreds. Uh, it's a streetwear, clothing brand, lifestyle brand, uh, been obsessed with since I was in high school. I've always, that's one thing I, I forgot to mention. It was really sports, music, and fashion. Um, I've added cooking into that in the last five or six years. I'm really passionate about cooking. It's like therapeutic for me and calms me down and stuff. Um, so fashion has always been there. I've always been huge on, you know, the uh, hype beast now is what they call them. But, I, you know, I had diamond supply T-shirts from 2006 and, you know, Stussy T-shirts from 2005. Like, I'm, I'm, you know, we out here. But um, I read that book, bro, and it really, it was awesome. It was him basically talking about the struggles of creating your own brand, your own, your own clothing line, how fickle the industry can be, how easy it is to you know, to fall off as a clothing line and not be cool and trendy anymore. And, you know, what do you do 10 years later when skinny jeans are in? Are you still going to have the skater baggy pants that you want to sell that you started off selling? And then 
what happens if you do switch to skinny jeans? Like you lose your core fans and then those supporters bash you on Twitter and then it goes viral. And, you know, so it was just all this stuff about his ups and downs and his experiences as a business owner. And um, it was awesome. It gave me a lot of kind of clarity in, in regards to myself and being a small business owner and just learning that there's, there's different levels, bro. Like there's DJs, like I mentioned earlier, who, you know, they do the clubs and the bars and there's nothing wrong with that. I should have said that earlier. Like that DJ is perfectly fine. I was that DJ for a while, but you know, I'm, I DJ for Red Bull now. I'm the regional Red Bull DJ. I do a lot of corporate events. I still do the clubs and bars to give me that juice. But, you know, there's levels, just like any other business, there's levels to uh, uh, running your own business as a, as a DJ. And, you know, reading that book just gave me a, a great perspective on pivoting. And, and, and sometimes you have to do things that aren't in your comfort zone and you have to learn new skills and you have to grow when one thing might need to take a, you know, kind of a break and that's, you know, i.e. DJing. So um, I just recently, I mean, we, we can go back to what I was doing during COVID, but just recently I actually just got a job at a, uh, as a technical support specialist at a IT company called uh, C1 Security. And they, uh, they're an independent security and compliance firm. So they do like cyber risk management, program development, technical support. Uh, they work in federal government. So I'm gonna be working with uh, Zoom for government. So I'll be running technical support for Zoom. Uh, they work in healthcare, energy, technology, financial services, state and local governments. Um, so there's that pivot I was referring to. And I never, you know, it, it's <laughs> it's weird to talk about. I haven't actually I haven't really talked about any of this kind of stuff. Uh, so yeah, during COVID, uh, I learned how important it is to have as a DJ, we'll go back to the DJ thing, to have a relationship with not just the managers of a club or a bar. Those people are disposable for the most part. They come and go. Um, for example, I, I used to DJ at a, I was a resident DJ at a place in Charlotte called The Local. And I texted the manager who I was there when I was DJing and I figured out he wasn't the manager anymore. And uh, I then reached out to the owner uh, just to check in and she was like yeah we can't wait to have you back and that was that moment that light bulb went off and I'm like man like you realize things like that that's what I one thing I realized during COVID for sure how important it is to establish uh, a, a, a deeper relationship with a, a business that you're working with and not to get stuck within you know you have a lot of in Charlotte this happens in Raleigh this happens you have one company that owns like five bars <laughs> or five clubs and you could just get stuck and you end up working for that one company. So I've learned that as well. It's like, don't, you know, kind of, don't put all your eggs in one basket. Um, so I, that really hit me. Um, staying relevant is another one. You know, I streamed, I had a stream for six weeks uh, on Tuesday nights from April to May, mid-May. And then when the George Floyd thing happened, I, you know, I, bro, I was crushed. I, I just couldn't, I just, I was like, there's bigger things going on right now. And you know, in a weird way, it's like, all right, well, people might, you know, find your music uh, therapeutic and, you know, a distraction from what's going on. But I just, I, it was so sad and messing, you know, fucked with my head. So I stopped streaming them, but that was one way I was trying to, you know, stay relevant. And, you know, throughout these years, my brand is, I like to think my brand's been very organic. Like it's just me being Nev and just being an idiot and, if there's one thing I've noticed though, especially what, you know, I'm about to start this new job, it's gonna be an adjustment for me is I, I don't think I've taken enough of a uh, business approach to my branding. You know, we have these intentional posts that are like, you know, I post stuff with my brand. And I, I, I don't ever wanna come off as spammy. That's like my biggest thing about branding is like, you wanna be relevant, but you don't want people to see your, your post and think, Oh, it's just one of those again. <laughs> um, we could have a whole conversation about branding. <laughs> like that's, I'm like just in 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 good ways and bad ways. I'm obsessed with it right now because I'm I'm going through a similar transition or just like a moment in time where same thing last year with COVID, where I got laid off from my job in March 
And then I had a couple teaching gigs throughout the year, but was like mostly unemployed. And so I'm like, how, how am I going to build like some stability for myself going forward, even outside of COVID? And I had been interested in building this, this Buddy Ruski brand and doing podcasting and writing and stuff. And so I started to take steps towards making it a little bit more official. And one of the things I kept coming back to was like, you know, there are people out there that are relatively successful at this. And they're just like, in your face all the time with those same kind of posts you're talking about where you're like, I know this is a, this is like a, um, it's not that it's inauthentic, but it's like, they are curating everything so hard that it's just like, I, I don't, I, I saw that kind of stuff. And I was like, I, that can't be me. Like, I'm just not that kind of person. And so how do I stand out and be myself in through this brand while also like actually reaching people and like sort of keeping up and staying relevant, like you said. And that's just, I mean, that's like a whole other podcast, whole other, like <laughs> almost like an AA meeting that we all us creatives yeah. need to attend um, because yeah, it's just, it's tough. But I mean, for what it's worth, I feel like, you know, I understand what you're saying about doing like DJ Nevy brand specific posts, but I also just like love checking your Instagram and it's like Nevi in the kitchen, like cooking up some delicious meal or like <laughs> you in the car, like, you know, bumping some tunes or whatever. Like I, I just find those types of quote unquote influencers or like brands or whatever, like people doing things that I both appreciate for myself, but also like appreciate watching them do it. And, and not in like a, you know, again, not in like this very branded curated way, but just like, oh, that's dope. Like, you know, I, I enjoy supporting Nevi. So I'm just gonna like watch him do his thing. And um, yeah, anyway, like, yeah, the branding thing that. is a is a like Pandora's box. <laughs> yeah, no, I appreciate that, bro. And likewise, I mean, your content so is dope. And I, I, whenever I see your story, like you're posting a dope song and like, whether or not you had something with most deaf and I'm like, yeah, like, like Justin knows. <laughs> yeah. And uh, I've never like seen your story or anything you post. And, and I've never gotten that feeling of, you know, this is, this isn't authentic or this isn't him or, you know, I think that's a great, you know, a great vibe. And yeah, maybe we can have that branding chat some other <laughs> off, off air or something. Uh, I'd like to uh, talk to you more about that. Um, one thing I, I did want to mention about the COVID is like, you know, I've been looking for a job. Um, I told you about my roommates. <laughs> uh, no, so I'll just say it. Yeah, I, uh, I eventually ended up just like moving in with my parents just for now. Um, I, I, you know, I had a roommate and all that, but then he moved out. And, you know, with COVID, I wasn't trying to find another roommate. Been looking for a job. Think, you know, fortunately, I found one. But um, throughout these you know, last nine months, 10 months, I've you know, been looking for a job. And one thing that like, you know, it's just like trying to find like, when you lose your purpose, you know, you lose your thing, like you're the catalyst, like the thing that keeps you going every day. So like, I can only look for music, cook, clean and work out, but so much, you know, and I've been so low key, because I'm staying with my fam. And I don't want to put them at risk. Like I could DJ in Raleigh, you know, shout out you know, Cornerstone, Southern Chard, Dogwood, Milk Bar, you know, they've reached out and fuck with y'all, but I've just had to say no, because I can't put my, my parents at risk. Um, and, you know, that I don't, a lot of people are saying this towards the end of the year, it's like, and I've, I've noticed it for myself before it became a meme. It's like, COVID has sucked and this year has sucked, but I grew closer to my dad than, I mean, I talk, you know, talk to my dad more in the first three months of COVID than I had in, I don't even want to say it, you know, a long time. And, you know, I love my dad, like we're good and all, you know, it brought me, it really did bring me closer to my, my family. And um, it, it's, it's, it's been, it's had its ups and downs, but so I getting back to like that purpose and finding that juice, you know, um, I was fortunate enough to uh, inherit kind of the, uh, the role as the, the official UNC DJ for my boy, DJ Forge, one of my other mentors, shout out DJ Forge. Awesome DJ, awesome human, just a great guy. Um, you know, him and Rain, 
they have their uh, monthly uh, Friday uh, gig over at uh, Arcana. And I mean, that's, that says it all, dude. Those two guys are awesome. They rock out. So shout out DJ Forge. So when I got that, that, that role, um, you know, DJing the football and basketball games, it was huge. And it gave me that juice. You know, I was like, yes, I have deadlines and objectives and like, oh, and I, I, I needed that so bad, bro. But like, it's like, how do you create that if I didn't get the UNC role? And that's what I've been chasing. I'm like, there, you can only do so much of one thing. And I, uh, how do you challenge yourself? I, I did learn, uh, shout out my boy c uh, He's a DJ up in uh, New York. He helped me out with uh, learning Ableton, uh, a production software. So I kind of taught myself that. And But one thing I learned, well, it seems really obvious, but if you're lost in the sauce, and I think it's something that I need to work on, is I'm like a go-getter. I want to be the best at whatever I do, but I think sometimes I need to be better at putting my mind to more than one thing at once so getting the unc role forced me like you can't play dirty music so let's say you have a clean version of a song and the song says fuck you can download or purchase a clean version of that song and it edits out the word fuck but in a unc environment at the stadium at keenan stadium or the dean dome for basketball games in front of twenty thousand or fifty thousand in the football there's families there. You can't play hell. You can't play, you know, you can't play gang or smoke or chopper or guns or Zaza or, bro, I have a list of words that I had to, urban dictionary. <laughs> I literally have a list. Zaza? We smoke in the Zaza? And so I had to make, <laughs> I had to make clean edits of clean edits. And if it wasn't for the UNC role, I wouldn't have learned Ableton. And then I wouldn't have been, I wouldn't have been forced to make clean, like super clean edits of songs. And it hit me and I'm like, I had those moments where I'm like, damn, Nev, like, why, why haven't you learned this before? You know, you're a DJ, you already have like the ear and like the, the train of thought, you know, like the order of operations or whatever may be the technicality of applying yourself and, and having the timing down and knowing when to, to take out a word and have it be synchronized and all that kind of stuff. So that was one thing I learned uh, during COVID for sure, bro, was um, just start applying myself more instead of doing it just, you know, just in DJ. I love, I feel like I'm going to have to, uh, at the end of the show, like make a list of all the people that you've shouted out because, and it's amazing. I love that you like have all these people (laughs) in your life that have, you know, have been meaningful to you, whether it be other DJs or you know, club owners or bar owners or whatever. But um, yeah, I definitely need like a, a like Nevi's VIP list or something that I post on the website so people can <laughs> Bro, keep track of all these so, people. Uh, I love that. There's so many more. Whenever whenever we get to my DJ inspirations, uh, there's a bunch. Uh, Let's do it now. Into. Okay, okay, cool. Um, one thing I want to mention about uh, going back to Cat's Cradle I mean, I'm, you already know this, but the listeners probably don't. I'm, a, I'm, I'm kind of crazy, you know? <laughs> and so I do have scattered brain, but there's always a method to the madness. I'll tell you that. There's always a method. Um, it was really cool with Cat's Cradle, though, the music venue, is, you know, growing up and seeing all these, like, legends performing there. And then, like, 10 years later, I'm performing there, like, opening for Waka Flocko. Shout out to my boy Wells. Um, if y'all don't know Wells, look him up. W-E-L-L dollar sign super talented guy uh i dj'd for him for about two and a half three years i mean we opened for all within like a very short amount of time you know we had shows with we opened for waka flocka twice in chapel hill we went down to atlanta with them we opened for ray schremer we opened for big crick kevin abstract gold link sylvanesso we did moke fest open for denzel curry open for jizza open for uh sheesh I don't even know, it, bro. I mean, we did a lot together and uh, Chad's French, uh, we did Shikori Hills. I uh, actually attended Moog Fest in Asheville in 2010 when I was in college. So it's really cool, you know, flash forward, what, like seven years to, to DJ that event, that festival in, um, in Durham. So I guess we can continue on with the shout outs, bro. And this is, you know, the shout outs aren't coincidental, you know, like, you know, me referring to 
to me, I don't see it as a competition. You know what I'm saying? Like you let your skill set speak for itself. You don't, it, it's, it's funny. You see these DJs on the gram and stuff, not DJs I know personally, just like random stuff I've seen throughout the years. And it's like, I, I don't mean to sound like a snob or anything, but I mean, honestly, most DJs that you have on there with, would agree it's like you, you have these djs that are out there and they say yo i'm the best dj and they say it to their followers and they say every day and then six months later their followers are like yo dj fuck your couch he's the best dj <laughs> like earlier i was telling you like i'm not all over the mic like that like i when i'm djing i can be but i try to let my my skill set and i love interacting with the crowd i love fucking with the crowd i love wordplay i love playing James Brown in the middle of a set and then flipping it into like whatever, like a, a, a Drake song or something. Like I love doing that. I love taking risks. That's, that's what it's all about. The rewards, you know, and you said, do you ever have, you know, you know, times where you like the crowd doesn't like your song. It's like, I mean, if they don't, then like, what are you doing? You know, for me, it's like, it's so, I'm, I'm glad I'm, I brought this up. It's so easy to be perceived as a good DJ. You go in, you play top 40, you play the music that they want to hear and they think you're amazing. For me, that's just too easy. I'm like, I get bored with that. Like, bro, I did a 1940s event at UNC just because I knew it'd be hard. I'm in there playing like Elvis Presley and like Chubby Checker and like all this, you know, crazy shit. Um, that's amazing music. And you kind of get to that point with DJing where like, you know, I mentioned getting lost in the sauce and like you're kind of going through the motions and you think you're killing it because you're busy. But just because you're busy doesn't mean you're killing it. It just means you're busy. Are you growing? Are you challenging yourself? So stepping into the corporate market and the Red Bull market and, and then the weddings and stuff, it's like you're challenging yourself. You know, I was trying to keep my juice. Uh, I've had a lot of DJs tell me, you know, my boy Rain told me, uh, I think it was Sammy Automatic, shout out DJ Sammy Automatic in Raleigh. He told me, you know, uh, at a New Year's event that I do with iHeart Media and uh, the local radio stations, I told him how much I was DJing. He's like, oh, you're going to burn out. <laughs> and he was like, dead ass. He was just like, you're going to burn out. And at first, I was like, I was kind of like, uh, okay. I and then, you know, a couple of years go by and I'm like, all right, I kind of see what he was talking about. Like, you know, and uh, my boy Yona told me that too. Uh, shout out DJ Yona. He's an awesome DJ in Charlotte. And, and uh, he, he mentioned the same thing, you know, just trying to keep it funky. I want to shout out um, my instructor from the Scratch Academy uh, in Chicago, uh, he was my first, you know, the, the first guy that, you know, gave me lessons. He actually won, uh, the Red Bull three style us. And I think it was in 2011 sick DJs names, big ones out of Chicago. Shout out big ones. Uh, can't thank that guy enough for kind of giving me that introduction to, uh, the art of DJing. Um, but I've always been into, uh, you know, RJD2 and people like that back in the day, he was the first, he performed one time at the local 506 and he had the MPC strapped around his neck and he was, he was beating the pads, you know, against his chest and making tracks. And he was performing with this guy named Blueprint. Um, and this was probably in 2005. And I was like, nobody had ever seen anything like this. And when I go back to my inspirations, I think about people like that, that maybe in the moment I didn't, I didn't realize were, you know, kind of the glue. And now I look back and I'm like, man, yeah, this is where my ear is now. These are the kind of sounds I like. And, uh, you know, you mentioned earlier, there's a time and place. It's like the mumbo rap. Yeah. Like I was one of those guys initially I was like, oh, it's kind of boring. Um, you know, the huh, da, da, huh, da, da, huh, da. But I actually grew to like it a lot. Um, and, you know, people talk about substance and all that. And I'm like, yeah, there's a time and place for substance as well. Um, I think some of the problems for me that originated with like trap and like down tempo music was it just doesn't have a lot of energy. So, and it, it can, but like if you have a slow song, like Chill Bill, you know what I'm talking about. 
that shit is so slow, bro. How are you gonna be in a club? How are girls gonna be dancing? How are they gonna, you know what I'm saying? How are dudes gonna be dancing to that? They just rock back and forth. You kind of lose the energy, the use, you lose the juice, but you pick your moments. And what I've noticed over time in regards to that lack of energy is you play the right song at the right time with the right crowd and the crowd provides that energy. Cause it might be a song that's like slower in tempo, but like they create the energy. They're all rocking, they're all singing it. And the next thing you know, it's a vibe and yeah, let's, let's keep doing this. Let's figure out different ways to make this happen throughout the night. And so I, it was it was a, a learning process for me with that though like and I've like I said I've grown to like trap and all that kind of stuff I didn't I never hated it I just you know there was, I just had to realize how to fit it in to a night uh, in a crowd and picking your moments and stuff and then you got crowds that like all they want to hear is trap and they don't want to hear anything else and that's fine too and that's up to your discretion you know so I'm curious what you are thinking about sort of going forward like do you think that djing will continue to be your uh you know your life's blood or are there other as you're talking about like you mentioned getting into cooking and like you know are there other passions that you're finding especially during covid where you've been forced to in some ways where you feel like you know maybe i'll make a pivot in you know three years into this other thing or maybe i'll start doing djing halftime and like i'm gonna really get into this other thing is there anything on your mind where you're like i, I want to explore this a little bit yeah um i've had those moments throughout the years and then i just didn't commit you know uh, i actually had the privilege of djing the um north carolina uh, chef showdown which is like north carolina's cooking competition and I remember DJing it. I was like, wow, this is epic. Like all things that I love, music, cooking, food, competition, judging, all this shit. And I was like, how can I create this? How can I like step into this market? So I've, I've had those moments where, and I, and I never figured it out, you know, like, could you be a DJ that like just travels <laughs> and like does like DJing competitions and, or, or food competitions, cook competitions and, um, so I've, I've had those moments here and there. And then I've, I've definitely had, you know, uh, I don't, I don't have like a shit ton of followers. Like I don't have like thousands, but I do have like a high interaction rate with the followers I do have. Like I fuck with them. They fuck with me heavy and there's lots of love there. And, um, you know, going back to my boy, Jack, that man just artists, like he's always been like, bro, you could be a rock star. Like just start making like videos of like, take all your, your like cooking videos and put music behind them and make compilations and like do all this stuff. And like, you know, then I've had other people like, dude, make a YouTube video and like, or a YouTube channel and like, just be yourself. You're hilarious and you're, you're genuine and you're real. And I'm, I'm always like, thank you so much. And I, I think, I think some of it's fear, you know, obviously I'm not going to front, you know, why I never stepped into those types of other roles or sources of income. But I, in, in regards to like blowing up or whatever and being viral, it's like, I've always thought like, I'd rather just be myself and like let it happen because like if you start doing it with the wrong like and it's not you and it's not authentic then you blow up and then you're like well who am I because you never were yourself from the beginning so that's always kind of been like a mind fuck in, in terms of like how to approach that like going viral or like whatever people tell you they think you should do um and so with having this corporate job going back to your question um I'm excited about it bro like I'm ready to learn and grow probably going to get uh it's called a comp tia certification like a plus certification it's basically like the stamp of approval like the golden standard if you work in it and I, once again i'm going to be helping people you know i'm going to be helping people troubleshoot or whatever it is and I, I hope and i think i believe that'll be rewarding for me and you know using my communication skills etc as far as and you know i want to grow in that space you know i, I want to become i always say this to myself like if you're not trying to become a better version of yourself and if you're not willing to take constructive criticism or even ask people for feedback, then like, what are you doing? Like, I don't, that's always been my thing. Like I always want to become better, like a better version of myself or like just, I, I, I don't know. Sometimes it's like to your own like detriment, you know, sometimes you're a little bit, you know, it, it's a, it's a, it's a slippery slope with that kind of shit. But I strive for perfection and I, I know it's not achievable, but I try to do the best I can. So 
DJing, no, bro. Like that's gonna be, I, I can't, I don't even know how, it's not gonna change for me. I, I don't see how it could, <laughs> like I'm addicted. I love it. Like, I just love that connection. I love that, you know, you can have, I feel like I can have the same experience if I, if it's a slow night and I DJ for 15 people and that connection you have and just vibing, then with like, I've DJed in front of three, four, 5,000, you know what I'm saying? Like, um, you know, I, I did an event for Dreamville, like an RSVP event for Dreamville last year. And there was like, you know, it's in a house and, and they're like giving out free merch, Dreamville merch, all this kind of shit. And it's like, um, you know, maybe like 30, 40 people in there at a time in and out and like, just vibing with them. I remember that was like such, I got to play whatever I wanted and they were, we were on the same page. You know, you're playing boss, you're playing McJenkins, you're playing. So I had this moment where I'm like, I can play all the shit I actually want to play. And I remember that like so vividly, like just like how dope that vibe felt in that moment. And it wasn't like people are dancing, they're like shopping and like, you know, getting free merch and shit. But just that feeling is what I know I can't get away from. Like maybe I can find it in another way, but another source, but I love just interacting with crowds and, and, sh and you don't even have to know people. And by the end of the night, like you've had this like very um, specific, like this very organic and very like uh, spontaneous like type interaction, like something that can't be recreated, you know? And I love that. So I'm going to put my best foot forward with the uh, whole, you know, the IT thing and uh, see how that job goes. And, you know, I'm going to strive for greatness with that. And I'm going to continue to DJ. I'm super stoked about the UNC shit. Hopefully this time next year, I'll be DJing in, in the games. Cause right now I'm just recording music and sending it in uh, for the basketball and football games. And we'll see what else happens, man. Maybe I step into some, YouTube shit. Uh, I don't know. I, like I said, it's given me a lot of time to maybe pursue these things that people are talking about. Nev, like, bro, like, use your authenticity and like your, you know, your personality to your advantage. Um, but uh, real quick, before we get out of here, I, I do want to shout out a couple more people uh, do it. <laughs> um, that I didn't mention just in terms of the creative space here in, in, uh, the local scene that I know you had kind of asked me about before. Um, you know, for me, it all started with Little Brother and Ninth Wonder, Kazi, the away team, Justice League, and, you know, obviously Big Daddy Kane. I wasn't around when he was around, but I mean, you know, Little Brother, I mean, I, I don't even, I could talk about them all day. So I'll skip over that. Um, and then obviously shout out my boy Wells. That's my guy. I love you, bro. Uh, G Yamazawa. I mean, I mean, <laughs> That's self-explanatory. The guy is so freaking talented and such a good human. Um, he told our story on, on your podcast about how he, he asked me to DJ for him <laughs> the first time yeah. we met. And he, I swear, we both remember it differently. But my version of this story, I said I was going to clear the air. Clear the air. CG Yamazawa at the local 506. Uh, Wells. Uh, was trying to get his music on his uh, on his thumb drive. It wasn't working. Something something had messed up, and I'm waiting on him to fix it so I can load it in. And the show, you know, we go on right after G, and uh, G's like, "Yo, yo, can you can you DJ for me? I need a DJ." Like, and I'm like, "Oh, bro, I'd love to, but I can't. You know, I don't know G. I mean, it had nothing to do with knowing him, but I, I just mentioning I didn't know him, and I would have DJed for him, but I couldn't because I had to get this music from Wells because we we're on right after G." So I was like, oh, I'm so sorry, bro. Like, we're having some issues with our music and our set. Like, um, I got my boy Alec here, though. Let me ask Alec. Um, because, and shout out Tune and Law. Forgot to shout them out. Dope artist. Alec was DJing for them that night. And out, they were after us, so or before us or something. So he had an opportunity to DJ for G. <laughs> he, thought, he, he got the wrong vibes. He thought I was like, no, fuck, fuck, fuck G. I don't know this cat. And, bro, he murdered it. He started performing and I was like, yo, this dude's a star. He's a superstar. He's so talented. He's such a good person. Um, and so, uh, yeah, in terms of the creative space, I think there's a lot of potential. Uh, growing up, it was, I think our creative scene, our, our, our music scene was fucking dope. And it kind of fell off and I think it's coming back like full steam. I mean, we've got the baby, we've got GM, we've got Wells, we've got Stunna from Vegas. Um, 
I also want to shout out my boy Snyder, dope producer from Raleigh. Uh, he's making moves. Uh, my boy Northside Rocky, he's making moves. Uh, and uh, this other girl that's working with uh, Kazi, she's super talented. She's making moves. Zaria, y'all should look her up as well. All really dope, man. I, I think there's a lot of potential and I think we're trending in the right direction. And, you know, we have, um, uh, what's his face? Uh, from Raleigh, who's a sick producer, uh, Oak City. Oh, Slums, yeah. Slums is fire, dude. Like, we, we, we're, we're good. <laughs> like, shout out Slums. Well, dude, yeah. thank you so much. I mean, like, like I said, I'm going to have to comb through this and get the shout out list, uh, <laughs> you know, on this, on the site somewhere so people can, can visit all these people, or maybe they'll just have to re-listen to the show over and over until they can, uh, download all this information. But, uh, yeah, I really appreciate you having this conversation with you, man. And, and uh, you know, I do really miss the opportunity to uh, come together, you know, as a creative scene and you know, all those people you, you talked about. Yeah, I haven't seen any of them in, in months, like every, you know, like everybody else. Um, so I look forward to the day where we can all get together and and have a good time like we uh, like we normally do. But where can people find you or where should you uh, where should people look for you uh, on on the Internet? Yeah, bro. Well, first of all, I just want to say thank you as well. Thanks for having me. It's really dope to catch you up. And um, yeah, I apologize ahead of time if I was like kind of all over the place, but I haven't really put all these, you know, these things out there like that. Like I haven't really, you know, other than talking to my mom day to day and shit like that here and there, I haven't really kind of let all this stuff out about COVID, about, you know, influences and all that kind of stuff I could talk about all day. Um. But uh, yeah, you can find me on Instagram at it's DJ Nevy, I T S D J N E V Y. That's uh, Nevy as in November, Echo, Victor, Yankee. All right, I'll stop. And uh, yeah, find me on the snap, same shit, but uh, it'd be Nevdo, like N E V underscore D O E. Um, I'm on TikTok, but I'm not really. I made one or two, and then I had like like twelve, like seven year olds follow me, and I was like, "What the fuck's going on? I don't even know what is this shit?" So I might tap back in. Um, yeah, bro, all the shout outs are real, bro. Like we don't have to get into that, you know. Just love people, be your, be yourself. You know, I, I'm a firm believer in like what you put out is what you get. You know, what I'm saying you put out good energy, you receive that shit, and I've always gotten that vibe from you. You've always been a real motherfucker and I fuck with you bro uh, thank you for having me on and I can't wait till we can link and you know just kick it maybe listen to some music maybe fuck around on the turntables hit me up when shit I, would, I would love to do all of that that all sounds amazing well thanks again for being on the show man and uh, and yeah make sure to follow follow Nevi um, if you've had the pleasure of seeing him perform before you know what the deal is and if you haven't you soon will learn because the dude is uh is a master on the ones and twos. Um, so thanks for listening to the Buddy Ruski Show and, uh, and we'll see y'all next time.